the 1st of February 2021, the military of Myanmar, also known as the Talmudor, took control in a coup d'etat. They accused the democratic government of voter fraud and arrested several democratic leaders, including Aung San Suu Kyi. In a resulting protest, over 700 people have died so far. As such, Myanmar has returned to the brutal military rule which has dominated most of its post-independence history, but while this is nothing new, neither are the defiant protests being held against it. I'm going to tell you a slice of this history about the first military dictatorship under General Ni Win, about student protests against his regime, and about how his brutality, his disrespect and his incompetence gave rise to a democratic movement which is still very much alive in Myanmar today. If you haven't watched my last video on Myanmar, let me just give you a quick recap. Between 1948 and 1962, Myanmar, or as it was then known, Burma, was a parliamentary democracy and it was run by a charismatic prime minister called Yu Nu. Now, despite his charisma, the country was extremely unstable. It had a really badly performing economy, the uh, leading party was split in two, and there were also constant insurgency attempts from ethnic minority separatist groups and from the communist parties. The insurgencies were the key reason that the Talmudor took over because even though secession was a guaranteed right in the Burmese constitution, it definitely wasn't something which was desired by the ruling class. It is believed in Burma that if Aung San, the founding father, hadn't been assassinated before independence, he would have been able to hold the Union of Burma together. However, under Yu Nu, secession was genuinely imminent and Nguyen may well have seen this as a betrayal. Now, Butwell says that the secession of the Shans in the northeast was particularly feared by the Talmudor as they believed this would lead to more insurgency and more separatism, and therefore they justified their coup as a way to save the division plagued Burmese state. So they took over and everything was strong and stable. Straight after the coup, there was a student protest led by the All Burma Student Union, which Aung San had once led. This protest was quashed, with unions banned and their union building dynamited by the leader Saint Lewin, and with over 100 students killed. With student unions defeated for now, let's move on to Nguyen's regime, where he followed a reformist economic policy called the Burmese Way to Socialism. Now, this had three main principles, which were nationalisation, Burmanization and industrialization, and this was essentially a revolution against the economic policy of the democratic government, which they thought was far too dominated by foreign and capitalist interests. The Talmudor nationalized key industries such as agriculture and banking, and private trade dropped from 68% of the economy to just 15%. Now this may seem revolutionary, but academics are actually not all that convinced that it is. According to Stifle, the scale and pattern of the RGUB's budget, except in the area of distribution, may not represent revolutionary departures from the past. As well as this, about a third of government spending went into the military, which is just... You know... It's difficult to accurately judge the results of the policy because Burma was extremely isolationist and as well as this they banned all non-government newspapers. However, from the statistics and information that we do have, it's pretty clear that the policy failed. For example, Butwell says that on paper their industrialisation was quite impressive, however their GDP growth was stagnant alongside it, suggesting that production didn't actually go up all that much. We can also tell that it failed from statistics about rice. Now, these were produced by the government, but look at the numbers. We can see that the rice production did not go up, so if they were trying to sell themselves as doing a better job than they actually were, they didn't really do a very good job of that either. We can also see how they did from the export numbers. Now, these are a bit more reliable as they're reported by other countries. These tend to relay how much extra stuff a country has that they can sell on, but while the production stayed the same, the exports dropped dramatically. Stifle explains that in a time when people had less income, they would have eaten more rice because it was a cheaper food than the alternatives, and therefore these statistics suggest that people were worse off under the Talmudor than they had been under the democratic government. Nguyen's government were not competent economic managers. By 1967, they'd actually increased the amount of land available for agriculture, but they'd not increased the production. Now, as with anything, there are inconsistencies. For example, under him, the life expectancy rose from 40 to 45 four years old and the rate of infant and maternal mortalities dropped by more than half. However, I think if we look at the process that came later on, it's pretty clear that people think he did a bad job. 
I wouldn't say his political management was much better. By 1972, General Ne Win was trying to make the regime look more democratic, so he resigned from the army and became a civilian leader. Along with this, he created a new constitution with a 600-person parliament with workers and peasants councils, and with a big emphasis on Burmese unity, however this was all for show. But while writes that Nawin's so-called civilian cabinet had 13 military or ex-military members and only two actual civilians. He also quite scathingly says that army governments do not cease to be army governments just because soldiers resign their ranks and wear civilian clothing. The constitution mandated a one-party state, the Burma Socialist People's Party, and all of the representatives in parliament would have to be vetted by them as well as this, the workers and peasants councils would have to toe the party line as well. By far the most transparent posturing was in their treatment of the ethnic minorities. Now, in the constitution, it mandated that Burmese would be the only official language and every other one would be relegated to second fiddle. Now, the uh, Burmans suggested that this would be a way to give equal opportunity to everyone, but when you look at the history of uh, the Burmans and the ethnic minorities' relations with each other and the cultural suppression that comes with that, this doesn't really seem entirely sincere. As well as that in the constitution was uh, this thing where it says if there's a law that only affects a local area, then these local representatives would have to agree in a majority vote that this was the right thing for their area. And this sounds great, until you realise that the BSPP has vetted every single representative who comes into parliament and therefore there's no way they're going to go against what the town would all want. Now the only concrete change that the military made in this constitution as regards ethnic minorities was the name of the country they were in, which they referred to as Myanmar rather than Bama to, you know, suggest this was no longer just the land of the Burmans, even though in reality it was. The militarism and the incompetence of the regime was bound to provoke a crisis, and by May 1974 this was already starting to happen when the Talmudor had to put down a workers' revolt caused by a lack of food. However, when sustained resistance to the regime did come in December, it wasn't caused by workers but instead by university students, and it wasn't caused by food but instead by a funeral. The Talmudor were already weary of student resistance even though there hadn't been an actual uprising since the 1960s when they banned the student union. However, they were so scared of it that it was predicted that 20% of the student body were secret police in disguise. So what was this great event in December 1974 which forced the students to rise up and come out of hiding? Um, well, in December 1974, a man called Yu Fant died and he was the former Secretary General of the United Nations. It may seem trivial that his death would cause so much unrest, but the Secretary General in question, Yu Fant, was a really important guy in Myanmar. He'd been a trusted minister in Yu Nu's government until 1957 and then moved on to the UN where he'd worked his way up through the ranks. In his leadership role, he was a key opponent of the Vietnam War, and it was these two things and his Buddhist faith, something which was very important in Myanmar at the time, which made him a sort of saint of democracy. Is it possible that at long last the arms race between nations will be halted? Is it possible at long last that by working together towards the solution of their common concerns, people will be united in trust and friendship? I believe so. Yufant's supporters wanted him to be buried near to the Shwedagon Pagoda, which is the holiest site in all of Myanmar, but because of his democratic principles, General Nawin refused and instead deigned to bury him near to a leper colony. Now this caused absolute outrage from the people of Myanmar, so a bus full of students turned up to the place where the coffin was being displayed for final respects, and according to an eyewitness account in New Mandela, they used um, the iron fences as spears and they killed and injured those who were guarding the coffin, loaded it onto their bus and drove it back to the RIT campus. On campus, engineering students built a mausoleum for the Fan on the site of the destroyed union building and they flew the banned student union flag, the Buddhist flag and the UN flag at half mast. Now the UN flag is particularly important here because it had been draped over Yufan's coffin and they thought that by flying it they would attract international help. Uh, Andrew Self writes, for example, that um, the students in particular had a highly idealised view of the United Nations. Their use of the UN flag and appeals to the UN for help were based on the widespread but completely unrealistic expectation that the organisation could and would bring its weight to bear on the issue, thus obliging Nay Win and his government to respond sympathetically to student demands. 
The optimism turned the funeral into an anti-government political rallies with lots of speeches against the government and as Andrew self writes, as the days passed these speeches became more strident in tone and more defiant of the authorities. Even parents joined in, reportedly saying this time we will not allow the government soldiers to kill our sons and daughters. These protests were joined by well respected Buddhist monks and they scared Ne Win to the point that he agreed to bury Yu Fant's body near the pagoda but this wasn't enough for the protesters and they saw a personal guarantee from Yu Fant that uh, there would not be any reprisals against them from the Talmudor. The new Mandela sums up the events with brutal cynicism, saying the brave or naive students who wrongly believed that the UN flag would protect them and thus gathered at Yufant's grave were clubbed and bayoneted to death right there by the grave under the huge blue UN flag. At 2am the police stormed the campus with uh, tear gas and baton raids and they'd taken control by 3am. They took all of the male protesters, both students, civilians and monks and they stripped them to their waist forced them to sit cross-legged and put their hands on their head while they processed them and then they made 3,000 arrests, only half of whom were actually students. After this they broke the mausoleum, retrieved the coffin and buried it near the pagoda in what's been described as a shoddy memorial. There was outrage about how the monks were treated and protests about that but this was put down by the Talmudor as well, not just with the brutality that they'd already shown at the Rangoon campus but also with propaganda where they depicted the monks who'd taken part as ones who weren't properly devoted to Buddhism and instead were just monks uh, so they could live off charity. So this seems like a pretty depressing, pretty anticlimactic event, but this was the restart of student uprisings against the Talmudor and against Nawin's regime, and this would really lay the groundwork for a much more important and impactful event which would happen just over a decade later. This event happened on the 8th of August 1988 and it's possibly the most important one in the history of democracy in Myanmar. The 8888 uprising would introduce us to important figures such as Minko Nain and Aung San Suu Kyi. It would end the rule of Ne Win, but it would also kickstart a second military government. It started when Ne Win devalued all banknotes except for the 45 and 90 Kayat ones. He kept these ones because they were divisible by 9 and he believed that 9 was a lucky number, even though it proved not to be a very lucky number for him because people were absolutely furious. The devaluation caused them a nightmare and wiped out their savings in one fell swoop. Students led the charge as the devaluation left them unable to pay for their exams and the unrest which resulted in this escalated into something known as the tea shop brawl on the 13th of March. Here a bunch of students got into a fist fight with the son of a local councillor um, and this escalated into campus protests which escalated into tragedy when the police stepped in and killed three students. Now of course this just produced more outrage and here we see the introduction of Pao Tung who'd become better known as Min Ko Nain, which means conqueror of kings in Burmese. Now, Min Ko Nain was already a political animal. He was quite an artsy student in high school and he'd gotten in trouble with the government for making anti-government satire at a theatre festival and as such been tailed home by secret police. So, you know, he was already kind of part of the resistance, but he stood up and he compared the tea shop brawl um, to other moments of student resistance in the enemy's history, you know, uh, such as Aung San's student strike and such as the youth fan funeral crisis and he called for two things the restoration of the all Burma student union and for a peaceful march to the RIT campus. According to Megan Clymer the route they chose on their peaceful march was the worst one possible because while it was the most direct it isolated the students denying them contact with the public, media exposure and sadly also an escape route. They were stopped by a military blockade and Min Kainane went up to this to try reasoning with the soldiers saying we are brothers. We understand your position but we have no guns, not even a needle, only school books. We are not harmful to you so please let us go. But the Tamador didn't stand down. The witness interviewed by Clima said the soldier warned them please go back to your classrooms. If you do not go back we will have no control over what will happen. The students were rushed from behind and beaten by the police and the military and while Min Ko Nain managed to get away there were many who weren't quite so lucky with lots trying to escape uphill to a lake only to be drowned or raped or dragged back into the fray. Once the police and soldiers were done they piled the dead and injured into trucks where a further 41 people died of suffocation but according to Megan Clymer this did not kill the movement but instead just made them angrier. The Conqueror of Kings was not done yet. 
Minko Nane started to mobilise the movement on campus and unable to afford photocopies or blue tack, he hand copied images which showed what had happened to students in the march movement and he stuck them to walls around campus using rice. After this he'd pretty much reformed the All Burma Students Union but he was pretty adamant that he didn't want it to just represent students and instead he wanted to push for a general strike in the whole populace which would support all people who'd been exploited and oppressed by the Talmudor. Now he'd set out four demands, one was the release of all students who were imprisoned, two was the return of all students who'd been expelled, three was the disclosure and punishment of those who'd been responsible for hurting the students in the march movement and was the complete abolition of the Nawin government. So the All Burma Student Union started pushing for a general strike on the 8th of August 1988 for eights because eight was another lucky number and they began to spread their message. There was a victory even before the general strike. On the 23rd of July Nawin resigned but he struck two very different tones in his resignation speech. He first offered a referendum on holding democratic elections, but then he also appointed Sein Lewin as his successor, the same person who destroyed the student union building. Nawin warned the students that when the army shoots, it shoots the hit. It does not fire into the air to scare him. Sein Lewin would make good on this promise and become known as the Butcher of Rangoon. Students, civilians and army defectors went out onto the streets. Buddhist monks held their alms bowls upside down to refuse tribute from the army, but over the next four days, 3,000 people would be killed. Not even this stopped the movement, and instead it evolved into one headed by the National League for Democracy, a political party led by Aung San Suu Kyi. She, of course, is the daughter of Burma's founding father, and she'd published two works on Burmese history, but before the 8888 uprising, she lived a quiet life married to the English academic Michael Aris. Hannah Beach's New Yorker article about her writes that her father's legacy had instilled in her a sense of destiny. Before she married Aris, she sent him a letter making it clear that her country came first. I only asked one thing that should my people need me, you would help me do my duty by them. She'd been in Myanmar to care for her alien mother at the time of the uprising, but she gave an important speech at the Shwedagon Pagoda after the general strike. The most integral part of the speech was, some might then ask why, if I wish to stay out of politics, should I now be involved in this movement? The answer is that the present crisis is a concern of the entire nation. I could not, as my father's daughter, remain indifferent to all that was going on. The national crisis could in fact be called the second struggle for national independence. As well as this legacy of her being the daughter of the founding father um, and this being a big part of her appeal, I think another part of this was her personality. For example, just look at this video. What do you think about the turnout here today? Good turnout. Is this defiance? I don't like to think of it as defiance. I like to think of it as courage. On the 11th of September, the government agreed to hold uh, multi-party elections without first having a referendum to decide on this issue, but there was disagreement within the democratic camp over whether to actually take the Talmudor at their word or whether they should push for an interim government. For example, the former Prime Minister Yu Nu said they should definitely try and get a democratic supporting government in power before the elections just to make sure that they capitalised on their advantage, but there was too much disagreement within the democratic camp for them to actually come to an agreement on this. The military government reformed on the 18th of September when a group of generals staged a coup and formed the State Law and Order Restoration Council. After this they cracked down on protest and despite promises of a free and fair election, on March 1989 they arrested Minko Nain. Now the student leader agreed to go peacefully provided he could make one final statement and they allowed him to do this and in it he said I am Minko Nain. I am the chairperson of the All Burma Federation of Student Unions. Now the military intelligence is arresting me. I'm not sure how many years they will imprison me. They might kill us, but that is not important to me. If Minko Nain physically dies, another Minko Nain will appear to take his place. Whether or not I die is not important. What is important is that we achieve our goal. The new military government made a series of laws making the election very difficult to contest. Take for example this passage about Aung San Suu Kyi. She recognised very early on that the military had no real intention of allowing free and open politics to flower. Registration as a political party meant the right to display a signboard, hold gatherings of less than five, and to obtain extra gasoline so that it was possible, theoretically, to move around and build support. But in reality, the decrees made it impossible to hold meetings, print and distribute party literature, and say anything that might be construed as criticism of the military past and present. Several times she said the law on gatherings is totally ridiculous. They allow people to register as political parties but they don't allow them to move. 
There's no freedom of the press. The government newspapers are attacking us all the time, but there's no way to retaliate. The election would be held in 1990 under these extremely undemocratic conditions, but the results would just be dismissed by the Talmudor, but that is a story for another day. Thank you so much for watching. If you're new here, this channel is Why Bo Joe. It's where I talk about history, politics, current affairs, and things like that. If that's your cup of tea, which I assume it must be because you've made it all the way here to the end, then please consider hitting subscribe and ringing the bell, and then you'll know the next time I make a video. And yeah, if you guys are interested in um, reading more on the topic, I'm going to leave some of the essays and stuff I wrote in the description below, as well as a link to uh, the weekly column I write on the website We Are Writers. But yeah, other than that, I hope you guys have a lovely day. I will see you next time. Is it day? Are you watching this in a day? I suppose you better be. It's not bedtime watching, is it? <laughs>